Uh, so update your apps a lot. Uh, fail your way into success. And don't be a jerk. All right, thanks. Good night. <laughs> now, um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a different talk, I think, than anyone else has done. But first, in case you don't know who I am, I am uh, Justin Williams. Uh, I am Justin on Twitter. Follow me if you'd like or don't. Ignore my background. But I'm going to talk about why I sold out. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So when I was invited to come here to One More Thing, we were kind of pitched on, we don't want you to do a technical talk, which is great, because I'm not really comfortable doing technical talks. I don't really know how to like, talk about blocks and retain counts and things like that in like, this live setting. They, instead, they wanted us to tell these personal stories. And I guess I can do that. So let me go ahead and tell you my story. Um, I graduated from Purdue University in Indiana in 2006, and I was a terrible student. I, was, I don't know how I have a diploma. I'm still convinced that if I actually open the envelope that they say has my diploma in it, there's just a little sticky note that says, ha-ha, just kidding. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do after college. Uh, I really wasn't one to go to the job fairs. I never bought a suit to do that. I really wasn't wanting to make a resume. So I graduated, I took my last final, and then it was kind of like, I know, I'll just start a company. That seems like a great thing to do. So the day after I graduated, I packed everything up, I moved back home, and I started Second Gear, which this was our first logo. It was not very good. But that was my Photoshop skills, hire a designer. So the first couple of years of Second Gear was a hodgepodge of a lot of different things. Um, I was kind of just kind of feel out what I wanted to do. I wrote a couple of books. Uh, I wrote for a newspaper about technology. And I did a lot of consulting with uh, web stuff with Rails, like super early versions of Rails, and then a little bit of Mac consulting as well. And the consulting was OK, but I really realized that that's not something that I really want to be into. And so kind of around the fall of 2007, I was finishing up this consulting job that started out pretty well. But what ended up happening was I got really burned out on it because it was just not a good project. And around Christmas, I just got to the point where I said, I I don't want to do this anymore. I can't consult anymore. So as anyone that's responsible would do as the age of 24 or 25, I checked my bank account and I was like, well, I've got three months worth of money in the bank. So I'm just going to build an app. We're going to see what happens. And this is kind of pre-iPhone. So this was on the Mac. And that is the impetus for my first app that I shipped. And it was called Today. And Today was basically just it was a daily calendar app, so it kind of tied into iCal, and it allowed you to uh, see just what events and tasks you had on your personal agenda for that single day. And it wasn't a runaway success at all. I've done a couple of versions of it, uh, version 1, version 2, and then this is kind of a version 3 I've been playing with, which I may or may not ship. But it wasn't a runaway success. It made enough money for me to cover my bills, to not have to really take too much consul consulting work unless it was something that I was genuinely interested in, which is rare because, again, I don't like consulting. But it allowed me to keep going forward, and it also allowed me to do something that I'm really big on, which is experimentation. So there was a little bit of an era that I would like to call my experimental years, um, LSD, cocaine, no. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of experimentation, however you might see that. Uh, so I did an app called Pocket Tweets. So back when the iPhone first shipped, uh, Steve Jobs got out on stage, and he started talking about how we're going to have, allow you guys to build these great apps for this new phone. It's going to be awesome. We've got this really sweet solution for you guys to build these apps. The web. It wasn't as sweet as he thought. But me and my friend Robert Anderson, we decided we wanted a Twitter client for the iPhone, and we built Pocket Tweets. And it was relatively popular for what at the time it was out. But then the native SDK came out, and we basically would have had to scrap all that work and build a new one. And Twitterific was out, and everyone was using Twitterific. So moved on to my next thing, which was my first native iOS app, which was called Fitness Track. I liked it. Nobody else seemed to. But so you just kind of you jump back in the well, and you try. I tried again. I built this app called Emergency Information in a quick weekend. And uh, I don't think anyone without the last name of Williams actually purchased this app, but I thought it looked pretty good at the time. Um, so I, the, my first introduction and kind of experiences with the App Store weren't that great. This is also kind of around the time that Apple was kind of feeling out the rules of the SDK and all these things and trying to figure out what they were going to do with these things. There was rejections. They weren't allowing in apps. They were saying you were duplicating functionality. So what does anyone who is very level-headed and not mean-spirited whatsoever do? Well, 
they set up a website called fuckingnda.com. And uh, this, I'm pretty sure, got me on a lot of do not associate with or acknowledge his existence list at Apple, which I've worked really hard to get off of. But I, I don't want to brag or anything, but I do think this contributed a little bit to getting them to removing the uh, NDA because it got a ton of press, which was good for me in a lot of ways, not in some others. You can kind of figure out who liked me and who didn't. But so I was running this site, and then the iPad came out. And I was saying, I'm still not going to get on this App Store thing. I'm really not. I, I'm going back to the Mac, where there's no App Store at the time. And I'm going to just work on that sort of stuff. But the iPad was awesome. And it was something that I was using more than my laptop. And I'm a developer. What do I want to do when I have these new toys? I want to build stuff for them. And so that's kind of where I got to the point where I wanted to go home for a weekend, and I was writing this newspaper column, as I mentioned before, and I wanted something where I could write on my iPad without having to take my giant laptop with me on the weekends. And around this time, that's when uh, Dropbox released their software development kit, and so it kind of clicked in my head. Hmm, UI text view, Dropbox syncing plain text files. Why don't I make an app out of that? So that's where I came up with uh, my app called Elements. And this was a kind of a labor of love. I built it in about 30 days just to kind of see if I could build it, because I wanted something to do. I was experimenting. And it was a labor of love. I honestly did not think I was going to put this thing out on the App Store. One, because I didn't want to seem like a giant hypocrite, because just nine months ago, I was running that lovely website I mentioned a minute ago. But also, I, just, I wasn't sure anyone would actually going to use the thing. So, I ended up throwing it out on the store kind of just to see. Like I, I think I posted on Twitter a couple links that said, hey, this app of mine is out. I hope you like it. Check it out. And then a lot of people ended up checking it out. On the uh, first day that Elements was available, uh, it made $15,000 after Apple's cut. I woke up the next morning, and I have really thick glasses. I thought there was a rounding error, and then I was misreading that, and it was actually like $15. But I've, I've never had $15,000 in a bank account in my life, and I just, I didn't know what to do. I was like, holy crap, this is awesome. And I, it just, if you look back at it now, it makes sense. This seems like a product that anyone would want, and if you see like the 15 million other Dropbox text editors that are out there now, it is a very popular market out, that is out there that people want to embrace and do all these really cool things with. But like we were talking earlier about how the App Store is a lottery, and in a lot of ways, it could be, but I don't think it has to be. In the case of Elements, I think my goal has always been to kind of target a specific niche, and that has been uh, productivity apps for nerds. And if you're targeting a specific market like that, it's really easy, one, to charge a, for a, a fair price for your product. In this case, I've charged five bucks. I've never had the app on sale, and people keep buying it. So if you target a specific product niche, and then instead of like general mass consumers, it's a lot easier to kind of determine if you're going to have a successful product. It has to look really good, and you can't build something that's super ugly, but that could give you a little bit of a general idea of how to make money and be successful in the App Store without kind of getting an app that is going to be on the Angry Birds or Train Yard level. I would never make a game. That's, that's a whole other market I do not understand. So that's kind of been my story up until the point that we are here today. And I've come to love this uh, Aussie rules football stuff. I know absolutely nothing about it, but watching it at bars, it seems really awesome. So for the past 18 months or so, what I've basically been doing is I've been updating elements. And I've been kind of like competing in this, like the new, what I call the new Twitter market. It's like everyone downloads the iOS SDK, and they used to make a Twitter client. Well, now they just make a Dropbox syncing text editor that supports Markdown, which is great for learning. It's not good for my business. But I've basically spent the past 18 months improving the app, adding features that have varying degrees of success. Elements was the first of the apps to uh, offer Markdown support, which was great, because it kind of made sense. You can take all of the stuff that you write, preview it in Markdown, and then share it out however you want. I also added some features that probably didn't make too much sense. I added support for uh, exporting a file as a PDF and then uploading it to your Evernote. I don't think anyone has ever done that. I think I tested it once, and it worked. And other than that, I don't think anyone has used that feature. So we work in this amazing industry. We get to basically go sit in front of a computer all day, surf the internet, check Twitter, post stupid things on the internet, and play with our phones, and we get to call that a profession. That's awesome. That is, it's really hard to even think about doing anything else, like going and like punching a clock or like having a job at a grocery store or anything and saying that you're 
it's hard to fathom that you would be burnt out or not being enjoying what you were doing when there's all these other people that don't get to do this awesome stuff that we do. But that's kind of where I started to feel like the past, like towards the end of 2011. I just, I was in, sort of enjoying what I was doing, but it wasn't really like igniting a fire inside of me as it used to be. I was, I was getting bored. I was feeling kind of complacent. And so that's when I decided it was time for me to make a change. So I sold out. And I moved to San Francisco. And San Francisco is kind of the tech hub of the world, so it seemed like a really great place to go after spending 29 years in the middle of Indiana where we have soybeans, corn, cows, and uh, casual racism. Um, <laughs> so I moved to San Francisco, and I joined Hipstamatic. And uh, you may not know of Hipstamatic. They are a really cool company based out of there now. They actually started in Wisconsin, and they build a really cool camera app that is not ranked as high as Camera Plus, but we still love it anyway. So you might be wondering, why would I do this? Why would I seemingly go backwards from what everyone's kind of goal is? Everyone that has a real quote unquote job is always looking, how can I go indie? How can I uh, do this thing where I can go and sit at home in my underwear all day and work on my own stuff all the time? So why would I do this? There's a couple reasons. Um, one I sort of mentioned is, uh, Working on a product nonstop for two years in a very kind of highly competitive market, it's kind of wearing on me. It's, one, it's hard because you're always trying to like compete and one up with one, all the other competitors out there. But two, I'm someone that likes to experiment. I like to dance around and try a lot of different stuff. But when you're kind of in the foxholes and you're trying to like make sure that you're gonna like knock down what IA Writer is doing or Byword or Notesy and make sure that people are still loving your app, it's kind of hard to get out and experiment with those things. So, Elements is still very successful. It's just a saturated market that's kind of hard to compete in. And after a while, it just got to the point where it wasn't as fun as I thought it was back in like late 2010. And beyond that, just working on the product, running a business is really a hard thing that I think is, like a lot of people don't really think about when they're talking about wanting to be independent and doing their own thing. You've got to deal with all this stuff like paying taxes four times a year. I don't like paying taxes at all, so having to pay them four times a year really sucks. Um, dealing with the, so you guys from Australia, you may, you, I hear you guys have this wonderful thing called uh, universal health care, where you don't have to pay for health insurance. It's included as part of being a citizen of your country. We don't have that. Um, and if you're independent, health care is ridiculously expensive. It was a giant chunk of my money just to make sure that if I got sick, I could go to the doctor without worrying that I was going to either one, die, or two, go bankrupt. Um, the other part of it is just kind of like running the business. The goal of running a business is to ensure that you make more money than you're spending, or you just take a bunch of VC money and that solves all your problems. But I was trying to build the legit business of making sure that I was making more money than I was bringing in, which isn't as hard as you would think if you're living in the middle of Indiana because everything's cheap there. But it was still kind of just mundane of dealing with the QuickBooks and going to see my accountants and dealing with the lawyers and all that stuff. And then finally, just Handling support is a really kind of a big load if you have a successful product. I outsource a lot of that, but that's not something that you can completely outsource entirely because I think handling support at a, at a certain level you need to do because you need to know what your customers are saying about you. You need to know what they're requesting, what bugs they're running into. And if your support guys are doing all that, then you're not gonna understand everything that's going on about your product and you're gonna be kind of in this little shell of your own where you're saying, well, I know what I'm doing and everyone likes it because I don't hear anything otherwise. So I wasn't enjoying doing the support, but I was doing enough that it was important, but it was kind of a day in, day out, kind of just grind to get through that. Another thing that was kind of bothering me was I felt that I'd plateaued as a developer. So Second Gear is me. I, my business cards say that I'm the crew chief of Second Gear, which sounds really awesome, but Second Gear is one person. It's me. So I'm the crew chief, I'm the CEO, the president, I'm everything. I wash the dishes, everything is me. I outsource design work, but I've never really worked with other developers beyond just a, like searching on Stack Overflow, bugging some people in iChat to get feedback, and I felt like I wasn't really growing as a developer as much as I was the first five and a half years of my career, and I was kind of wondering, well, why is that? Why do I feel like I'm not learning as much as I was? Because that's part of the fun of what we're doing is I really like learning this stuff. I mentioned before, I was terrible at school. It was because all the stuff that we were doing in school was not interesting to me. Learning the stuff that I was, I was, while I was failing out of my classes, I was spending that time learning technologies that were interesting to me. 
And as I was kind of working on this product over an, the course of the past year and a half, I was basically working on the same problems over and over, which sort of made me feel like, well, you're kind of just stuck here. So I decided, let's make a change. So the other thing, and this is kind of a big one, was fear. Now, despite I've shipped award-winning products on three different platforms, I've published a couple books, I've spoken in nu numerous conferences now around the world, I still feel like I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. And I, it's not just that I'm, that, that's not modesty. I honestly legitimately feel like you all think I'm a giant fraud standing up here who has no idea what I'm doing. And if you actually saw my code or saw what's going on inside of my head, you would just point and laugh and just run out of this room in disgust. So the last time I actually worked with other people in a, develop, in a development environment was in school and it was like a group project. And that's always been kind of a hindrance to me in terms of like working with others or hiring others. It's like, well, they're gonna realize what a giant fraud I am and how much I really do suck. And that's not really the best way to go about things. So a few days before I started at uh, Hipstamatic, I was reading around on the internet and uh, Koi Vin had written this, a link to this thing. Uh, it was describing this thing called imposter syndrome. And you wear a mask like that if you have imposter syndrome because it lets people know that you do. And I looked this up and Wikipedia said, it's a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. That sounds kind of like me. Um, despite external evidence of, the, of their competence, those with the syndrome remain convinced that they're frauds and do not deserve the success that they have achieved. That sounds like me. Uh, proof of their success is dismissed as luck, timing, or as a, real, a result of deceiving others into thinking more intelligent and com competent than they believe themselves to be. Holy shit, this is me. I've, I'm cured, I know what's wrong with me. And so I started, I mentioned this to a couple other people in passing and they read this thing and they're like, I feel that way too. So apparently all developers have really low self-esteem but we just don't wanna talk about it. <laughs> so I used to have a really big fear of flying and uh, the way I got over that was I spent a lot of time last year just traveling around the country to do these talks and uh, just go visit friends. And that's how I got over my fear of flying, is just doing it. If you had asked me 18 months ago to uh, fly 15 hours to Australia, there's no chance in hell I was coming here. But I got over that fear by actually doing it. And that's kind of what was part of the impetus of me going to Hipstamatic. I wanted to get over that fear of thinking that I'm a giant fraud and hopefully others will find out that I am hopefully talented at what I do, we'll see. Um, Second gear was run out of my basement in the suburbs of Indiana. And beyond kind of greeting the front desk girl at the gym every day, I really didn't have too much social interaction outside of iChat and Twitter because there was no one else in my house. So I'm basically just talking to my iMac screen. And that was fine for a couple years, but it seemed like in the past two years or so, I guess with age, I've gotten to be more sentimental. No. Uh, but I started to feel lonely and I started to feel like I wanted more human interaction in my life. And that really wasn't something that I could get with Second Gear without kind of going through the steps of trying to hire somebody, which it really wasn't the right time for me to do that. And so I decided it's time for a new challenge. It's time to just find something new that really is completely foreign to me, that's gonna kind of reinvigorate the juices and fires inside of me so that I'm ready to do something. So I moved to San Francisco and for the first time in my life, I'm working with a team in this completely new uh, city on the other side of the country on a product that I've used before, but using new technologies that I've never messed with. I know absolutely nothing about cameras and video and uh, V-image and all these like crazy technologies that those guys are using there. If that's not a surefire way to kind of like shock your system and restart and try to do something completely crazy and new, I don't know what is. So kind of the moral of this thing is do what you love. People look at being independent or indie as kind of this holy grail of a software developer's dream. But right now I'm kind of enjoying the fruits of having a steady paycheck and working on a product that I use every day and with a great bunch of people. It's, I can't stress enough how awesome and how much fun I'm having. This is the most fun that I've had building software since I first built today back in 2008 after I was burnt out on doing contracting work. So whether you're indie or fully employed, make sure you're doing what you love and are working on something that you're passionate about and that's a challenge to you. Because like I said, we're working on our phones on the internet all day. These are supposed to be really fun jobs. And if you're not having fun, if it starts feeling like it's a job to you, 
Find something that is really challenging to you, that gets you excited, and that's going to reward you, one, financially, but also, more importantly, personally. I have no doubt that eventually I'm going to go back. <laughs> I have no doubt that eventually I will go back to being an independent developer, but right now, I'm completely enjoying this new adventure that I'm going on. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to see my story continue. Uh, thank you, and have a good day.